Hey everyone, welcome to the cool table. We are here for the Bridgerton Book Club, second book of the series right by Julia Quinn. We're going to be talking about the Viscount who loved me. And uh, the only reason I know how to pronounce that word is because Beth taught me it's Viscount. I always read it at Vis Viscount, I don't know. It's a reader thing. Um, my name is Heidi. I am a writer, owner, co-founder at the cool table, um, huge fan of romance. And tonight I am drinking some whiskey in honor of Anthony and because that feels like something that he would drink. And uh, I'm going to open it up to our other uh, people on tonight, Beth what, and Julie and Karen. Uh, what are you guys drinking? Introduce yourself. And I want to ask a question that came from one of our uh, followers on Twitter from Ashley Burroughs. It said, a game of Pall Mall breaks out. Do you, one, race over and grab the black mallet, or two, remain on the sidelines and enjoy the show? or three, head inside for a stiff drink. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Beth. Uh, ignore my roots. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting my hair done tomorrow. Um, I'm having a huge glass of wine. And um, the game of Pall Mall, I would most definitely go grab the mallet of death. That is 100% my personality. But I also have been known to sit on the sidelines during like kickball or whatever, because screw that shit. So. <laughs> Somebody else, Julie. Hi, everybody. I'm Julie. I am not <laughs> drinking uh, a drink that Anthony would have. I'm having a margarita right now because it's 95 degrees outside. Um, so uh, I'd like to think I would grab the black mallet, but I would be that person who would grab the ba black mallet, and then Beth would be like, "I wanted that," and I'd be like, "Oh, here you go." <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. You know, and so um, I'm gonna actually combine number two and three. I would remain on the sidelines, enjoy the show, but I would do it with a drink because that's who I am. I'm like, this is a sporting event. I need a drink. So that's who I am. Karen? Hi, I'm Karen. I am drinking water because I drank heavily at dinner because it's been that kind of day. And I'm delighted to be here with my girls to talk about this book. Um, Admittedly, I have not read a Regency romance in 30 years. It's been since high school. And I tore through the first two books of this series. And regarding the mallet of death, I think it depends on my mood. But actually, why don't I ask my girls here, what would I do? What do you think I would do? I think you'd go get a drink and then go grab the mallet of death. <laughs> <laughs> I think you might let other people have, or at least you, at least you, you try. Would, I think you yeah. would still participate yes. in the Palm Mall, but you would be like, "Go get your mallet of death. Let's see who's actually going to win with yeah. something else." I think that's I think what you that's would do. Correct. I think I would let you think that you would win with the mallet of death, and then I would crush you. That's right. Right. <laughs> I yeah. would let the game go on, and then go back into the shed and get the pink mallet halfway through the game, and I'd still win. Yeah. 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 With a drink in your hand. <laughs> that sounds right. Hitting. Hitting. Definitely. I, I have no, I have no, like, and, I understand that anybody else would be able to beat me in any kind of physical activity. That is not, except I'm very good at basketball. Don't come at me with some basketball. I'm actually really good. I'm a great shot. Yeah. But Karen has an advantage over all of us in the sense that she plays golf. So when I'm thinking yeah. of this, this, whatever, you know, I'm thinking of um, golf and I'm like, Karen has the patience for that. Yeah, it's it's definitely not. It's a hand-eye coordination thing that I'm not into. Yeah. Of course, Amy, who's not joining us tonight, is like this semi-pro tennis player. You know she <laughs> yeah. would be amazing at this game. Yeah. yeah. And she'd make a stiff drink. I mean, she's the whole package. <laughs> yeah. So Alicia says she grabbed the black mallet, but she wouldn't play because who has time for physical activity? That is very Fair. Much my brand. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I would have had the black mallet... Uh, hidden the entire time and would have just pulled it out of my pocket. Like, oh, were you looking for this? That's what I would have done. <laughs> very Machiavellian. I would, like would, pay, would pay, play, play for blood. I yes, would like would. to think that I'm like sinister enough where I would just take paint and paint all of the mallets black and just be like, which one is it? But I'm not, I'm still that person who'd be like, would you like this one? <laughs> I'm cheering go, you on. Go right ahead. Go. Oh, my bad. <laughs> So. Um, what is Papa Shot, Leslie? Oh, that sounds very Midwestern. Never heard of that. <laughs> um, okay, so I wonder if that's like horse or something. Papa what is Papa Shot? shot? Like Papa Shot? It? Like this? 
Leslie, is it? I'm guessing she's talking about something to do with sports that I don't know what it is. Explain. And I go right to alcohol. We should say hi to everybody in the chat. Hi, Laura. Hi, hi Alicia. Hi, Brett. Hi, guys. Hi, Sheila. Hey, or Shelly. I always say Sheila when I see your name. I'm sorry, Shelly. Um, hi, everyone. Glad you're here. And if you haven't said hi to us, say hi to us. Facebook, YouTube, okay. Twitter. Yeah, say hi. All the things. There we go. Okay, so the, so am I pronouncing that correct though? Viscount, who yeah. loved me? Is yeah. that still a thing? Mm -hmm. Are people still called Viscounts? Or is did that go yeah. out? Nope. Oh. I mean, there's I still barons. There's still barons and earls and viscounts and countesses and. But, so, but as a countess is married to a viscount, then no, so no, no, that, no, 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 no. Okay, a so countess, how does that work? A countess is married to an earl. Right. That's I understood that one. So I think. A I thought that Viscounts being earls. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Countess yeah, is yeah, earl yeah. and Viscountess is, a, is the Viscount. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Emily says, yes, there are still Viscounts out there. Like a like a Vice Countess is how I yeah. want to read that one. No. Right, so, <laughs> I am. I can say it however I want to. Okay. I have the black knowledge of death. It's incorrect. <laughs> I can judge you from over here. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Um, all right, so Anthony and Kate's story. What I want to first talk about is what do you think the trope is on this one? Like, is it enemies to lovers? Is are we talking trauma bond? Is this a uh, reformed rake? Is this a duckling? What what is what do you think the trope is on this one, or all of the above? I guess, but that's kind of a cop out, Julie. I, I never <laughs> thought this was. I never it, like. I never thought Kate was ugly, like the ugly duckling kind of thing, because she was always compared to her sister, who was this soft, you know, little feminine thing. But I never thought she was. Um, I definitely think the trauma bond is there, um, very much so, um, in the sense of what, you know, for, for Kate, it's more subconscious. For Anthony, it's more to the forefront of his mind all the time. Um, I think that what, what I really liked about it is because there was multiple tropes. I don't think there was just one. Yeah. So that's I think what I really appreciate about it. Elise has a good one. She says it's the too much responsibility eldest child. Yeah, that's a good that's one. one. That's a good Definitely. one. Definitely, because it's both of them and it's bucket heads. Right. Hate love, I love that, hate love. <laughs> Hate love. Oh yeah, Andy just said hate love. I, I mean, I think that it's it, it's logistically it's an enemies to lovers, right? I mean, mm -hmm. they start out as enemies, but they haven't hated each other for a long time, which no. is usually how enemies to lovers works, where there's like history of hate. This is just right. like boom. Uh, what the problem that I have with it is it has the little sister part. He's supposed to be with the little sister, so it's like your little sister's boyfriend trope, which isn't a trope that I know of, like, mm. like brother's best friend is one, older brother's best friend, you know, maybe older sister's boyfriend is a trope, but yeah. that's, I mean, younger sister's boyfriend is not a trope. Right. It, it makes me hate the first half of this novel a lot. Mm. Yeah. Half sister. Yeah. Lover. Right. <laughs> what do you hate about it? Um, well, there's a lot, like, I, I don't want to, I don't I feel bad talking about it at the very beginning, but like, I just oh. really, I don't like the way Anthony thinks about her at no. the beginning of the novel. I find it really dismissive and ugly and it, it probably wouldn't, the story and the way that it's written probably wouldn't bother me if we didn't get Anthony's POV at the beginning. Um, but because we do, and we see him say all these things like, uh, she's even after he kisses her, he's like, she's almost as beautiful as Edwina. And I'm like, what is this is so ugly? Like, it's just, it doesn't fit my version of the way the man that I want her to, to fall in love with her thinks right. about her. It feels, yeah. and he's really like physically mean to her. He's like stepping on her hand and you know, all these different things. And I'm just like, this doesn't fit what I like about this. I don't like that they were trapped into the marriage and mm -hmm. before he ever got to the point where he really loved her. And I just, you know, there's just a lot about that that I yeah. don't like. That was very, for me, that trapped into the marriage very much. I was like, okay, this is going like hearkening back to the Duke and I kind of thing. Like, well, now we have to get married. You know what I mean? And um, um, Emily put a really 
I like Emily's take on it. It's also a lot of Kate and Anthony um, each coming to meeting each other with very solid preconceived notions of where they were each going in life. So yeah. a little bit of like pride and prejudice here. Like she thinks him this way. He thinks of her as this way. Set in your ways. Like Yes. Very set in your ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anthony wasn't, but then he grew, like, then I fell in love with him. But at the beginning, <laughs> there was a lot of like, oh, Anthony, no, no, no. Yeah. Um, Elise just said, come at me because they are my fave. Yeah. Okay, I get it. Like, no, I, I, like didn't, <laughs> I like I said, I didn't want to get into the things that did bug me about Anthony at the very beginning. I want to turn you guys off. Um, <laughs> Brett said he's a long term bachelor who doesn't know how to have a real relationship. That's one of the major tropes, right? Like, right. The rake who can't, um, can't figure out what it is he's doing. Um, and then Andy said, I actually like that because it was more like they were equals. He wanted to control Edwina and put her in her box, but yeah. he couldn't do that with Kate. Yeah. But okay. the reality is he really couldn't have controlled Edwina either. That, no. I mean, she was, she was her own strong character as well. Which was kind of interesting because at some point Edwina said what she wanted in a man. She wanted a very well-read man and a very studious man. And at first I was like, okay, that is, that's Anthony. <laughs> like, that's the guy. There it is. So, yeah. but but it was not meant to be. It it was not meant to be. What did you think, Heidi? Where did you think it fell in the trope world? Um, I think it fell. Okay, I wrote it down. Let me find my notes. Um, I think it fell more strongly on the reformed rake slash trauma bond. Personally, I liked that first line early on, where it was like, it, uh, I think it was Whistledown talked about under like the lowercase rake versus uppercase rake and that he was an uppercase rake because yeah, he does without great. any any morals about it and i actually wrote in my notes i wrote rake he's just an honorable dick because he has this honor but he's kind of just dickhead about everything um which i mean some people like that i'm personally usually the dickhead in relationships so it wouldn't work but that's i think why kate was too you know so that's what made it fun uh yeah so that's where I fell on that one. But I did think what one thing that really well bonded them was, and she it's a theme throughout all of Julia Quinn's books, is the idea of family, which is huge. Mm -hmm. for right. Family, the number yeah. one thing. And then the way they talk about mothers versus even fathers, even even down to that is is very clear delineation. Like there's always this trauma so far in the two books I've read. Um, like in the last book, Simon's dad was his traumatic figure because he mm -hmm. was awful versus right. in this one, Anthony's dad was his traumatic figure because he was so perfect in his mind Loving. Yeah. And, and like couldn't live up to him, even though of course no one is, but the way that he in his, in his 18 year old mind thought of his father was this perfect 38 year old man, which I'm married to a 38 year old man. He's not perfect. Um, but yeah, I just, yeah, I just think it's really interesting how she talks about family. So I was wondering what you guys thought about that difference. Like the moms in this one, like in the last one was, we got the Featherington uh, super putting her business in ever, up in everyone's faces again. The moms are are totally negotiating the relationship behind the scenes, uh, all of that. So I guess I was wondering how you guys see, do you think, well, I haven't read ahead. Are dad's going to be more of a thing going in or is this very much like a matriarchy family thing? I don't know because I haven't read ahead. I've only read yeah. Colin's book. So, um, but I, I didn't know that Mark and Ryan were the same age. Ryan's thirty-eight too. Yeah, I think. Okay. Well, actually, I think Mark just turned thirty-nine, so got to get on him. Ryan, yeah. Ryan will be thirty-nine in October. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I love the family aspect of this series. It's one of the reasons that I really like this series because a lot of times when you get into Regency romance, the families are broken, and you're just dealing with the girls of a family or um, a Duke and his friends that are, you know, they're running around doing whatever in the fit, like, um, you know, the daring of the Duke just came out, um, from Sarah McLean and that's a broken family in a lot of ways, you know, they had, or found families and things like that. So the fact that this one is intact and other than the father and like loving each other. And then there's the different roles that each of them play. Daphne is the oldest sister, right. And like what that means in terms of how she relates to all of them. And then, um, Anthony as the as the oldest and and Kate as the oldest and how that relates and then the, I, I enjoy that because I like the idea that they're coming out of uh, that the family is what's important and you see like Jane Austen -y tropes going in there but they're not all idiots instead of mm -hmm. all you know they're all chill and you all want them to do well so that's you know I like it and also Julia Quinn did something that a lot of 
children's stories and and I'm sure other books have done is she made the most loving stepmother. It wasn't yeah. the evil stepmother. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a woman trying to push. She wanted Kate out there just as much as Edwina. She's like, you are just as worthy as my, you're my daughter. It's, yeah. You know, no matter what you are. Mistaken. Right. You yeah. are still my daughter. And so I thought that was very touching, just showing the different families out there. And that yeah. this woman, even though the husband had died, the father had died, and and Kate's mother obviously had a tragic end as well. But we had a woman who was like, I'm going to love you. So for her to break away from the evil stepmother kind of trope, that could have easily been done in this in this novel. I yeah. I appreciated that. Yeah, Elise just said so many regencies are like, the old Duke sucked, I don't want to be like him. <laughs> and this one is, well, of course, Simon's book is like that, but at least for yeah. Anthony, it's the opposite issue. And yeah, I mean, Julia's doing the same thing with the stepmothers right. that she did with Edmund, which is to just, they're these epitome of good parents. Right. Whereas in most regencies, you always have the opposite. The parents are exactly. always bad or they're dead. They're either dead. <laughs> or they, and in this one, they're parents. dead. They're dead, but yeah. she breaks away from, and she makes a very caring, loving mother and daughter relationship. Yeah. So I appreciated that. Yeah. Um, Laura Robertson just said she loves Mary. She keeps thinking of um, Meredith Salinger, Patton Oswald, and we Alice. If you guys don't know who they are. Oh, they're... that's sweet. Yeah. yeah. Patton Oswald's oh. wife died. Yeah. Yeah. Meredith Mary. Salinger. Yeah. Adventures of Natty Gann right there. That's that's how I know Meredith. <laughs> I don't know Meredith. Yeah, no. Super old, 80s. Disney okay. Movie. All right. I don't know Meredith. There you go. I liked, um, specifically, I liked those scenes where uh, Mary, the stepmom, was going to the grave site of, of um, Kate's mom and like yeah. made a vow to her on the wedding day the same way she did. I thought that was just the sweetest thing. Yeah. So I'm interested to see how that plays out. But that yeah. kind of goes into the, uh, like that whole, this, this book is kind of dramatic. I mean, there's super fun moments, like the Newton, the dog, and that whole scene where she falls into the water was hilarious, even though I thought that Anthony got overly angry, but I mean, I get overly angry sometimes too. <laughs> that I, was like, I mean. Oh, and then like just said, oh. um, the next book um, offer from a gentleman has the worst stepmother ever, which, oh, they can't all be good, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Uh, that thought the trauma in his past wasn't trauma -y enough? Did you, did you, are you asking if we thought that? I, did not feel it was trauma -y enough. I was like, his, his or hers, I'm sorry. You extrapolated all of this where you're not going to live past 38 because there's no way you can be as pure as your father. I, was, I mean, I loved the book, loved it. But that was so hollow to me. I was like, Anthony, get the fuck over yourself. Really? Now, Simon, that's trauma. Mother dies in childbirth. He doesn't speak. He stutters. His father's an a-hole. But the whole thing with Anthony and his, you know, godlike father, I was just like, oh, get over yourself. And I, I didn't buy it. Was it I don't that know. Other, was Dang. it that other men in the family had died early? No. So yeah, no, he had an uncle that died early too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. My dad, so my dad's dad, when my dad was 21, died from a heart attack when he was 50. And so when my dad turned 50, my dad had a heart attack. And it was like, yeah, so like, it was, so we had all kind of been waiting for this birthday, even though we thought he was going to be fine. And then he actually ended up having one literally right before his 50th birthday. And so I kind of, I kind of believed it. I mean, and I get it. Not, but I kind of believed it. So this was like, I mean, that's not to take away from like, that is a traumatic thing. My dad did not live his life thinking he was going to die in however no. many years. Like that wasn't his story, but hey. But the thing know. about Regency is that it's not real life. These sure. are all peerage class people or you're a cinder girl and you get swept up and marry the crown prince. I mean, all this is <laughs> hyper fantastical and what you just described much to my chagrin is actually real life and i apologize for your family oh, trauma no, but there wasn't that. that like uber like oh my god i get it i believe it i think that men come on i think that men experience that kind of thing differently than women do i've never thought to myself well I mean, my mother is alive my grandmother lived till she was 98 so i don't know but like 
I can't imagine just being like, I won't be able to live past the age of my, but I think men almost universally yeah. kind of feel that way. I know yeah. that my grandfather, my dad's dad died at like 73. He had Lou Gehrig's disease. And my dad is not that far from that age. And I mean, he's fully ready to die. He's like, eh, you yeah. know, when I go, I go, it's fine. You know, my dad died at 73. It won't be a big deal. And I'm like, dad, that's like six years away. Could you shut yeah. up, please? Like you're just, you know, stop it. But I think yeah. men just universally feel that there's just something about living longer than their dads. I mean, Jamie Fraser does it in Outlander. Like he yeah. has this whole moment where he's all upset that he lived I think longer. It's I think it's about that mortality and being like, you cannot control that mortality. I know that my dad will say things like, you know, your grandfather died at 80. I don't know. If, I don't think my dad thinks, you know, I'm sure my father would like to live a, a ripe old age. Um, but I'm sure that's on the forefront of, of I, I know the women, I, I'll say this, not the men, more so in my family, it was the women in my family. So my grandmother, my great grandmother died at like 53. And it wasn't that my grandmother thought she was going to die at 53, but when she hit 53, it was like, you know, yeah. kind of a thing. Because it was trauma. Yeah. It was trauma how she she passed away. Well, I guess in my family, my, my grandfather died when he was 96. I right. spoke at the funeral. My grandmother on my father's side died when she was, well, she was really a lot younger than my granddad, but that's a whole other story. Um, so she was granddad. And my my husband couldn't wait for his father to die. He was a dreadful human being, yeah. like yeah. feared when it happened. So I am unfamiliar right. with this these stories that you all are, are sharing. And clearly, in the chat box, I am being told that I am absolutely incorrect. But <laughs> I my point. In I don't see. It's usually the trauma is is way more trauma y. I think that the trauma is not just that his dad died. It's that it was super unexpected. It right, was something right. so small and innocuous that happened all the time that you couldn't control. Right. And he had to sit with his body right. for such a long time. There was a lot of it. And it was oh, the age. He was, was, young. He was yeah. really young. It wasn't that he lived to like, even we'll say it's Regency, 60. And then <laughs> good yeah. for you. And you on know, top of that, he had to be... He had to be the head of the household immediately. So I just think it's yeah. like, it, what doesn't like sit super well is that it's the beginning of the novel and you're like, what? This bee sting? You're definitely, I, I mean, it's just kind of, it doesn't yep. feel real. It doesn't feel real. But I, but I think it, I think it makes sense. Right. Yeah. But that bee, so the bee is kind of the big symbol of the Bridgertons. It's everywhere. Like if you look up the Bridgertons on Instagram, it's the bee, the bee. Why is that the thing? That these people want to attribute to this whole scene. It's pretty funny. I don't understand. I mean, it was Napoleon's theme too, to be frank. It was Napoleon, so it was definitely the time. Napoleon what do you had mean? to be on everything. So oh, he did? Oh. Yeah. Fact, and keep in I mind, he was on my dining room table, and my friend Jeannie, almost ex friend, did not give me bees. I got stars instead. Hmm. <laughs> um, keep in mind that bees, the their leader is is a queen bee. Queen bee. Not Queen Bay, Queen Bee. John Bay. It's a woman. It's a matriarch. That's so. right. And I think that it has to do with that. And I also think it's because they're the Bridgertons and it's a B. So it's, you oh, know, the, letters, yeah. so the letter B, Bridgerton, uh -huh. and the B. And then there's Anthony and Kate get married because of a bee sting. It's not just mm -hmm. that the dad died because Which, of the bee sting, but the bee sting is what leads to their engagement. So, right. Which, right, by the way, if you're going to get the father dying, if you're like, going to get never tried to suck the venom yeah. off her bosom, if it's like that, you're going to get stung. If you're going to get stung on, if you're going to get stung by a bee on the boob, that's going to hurt. She was like, ah, ooh, ow, that's a little pinch. No, it's not. Yeah, she's ow. like, yeah. what are you doing? And then he starts sucking her booby. <laughs> Do you see in the comments, Emma has, says, uh, yeah. good thing you never knew about murder hornets. <laughs> Anthony would, Anthony, Anthony would be gone. Well, apparently we don't know anything about them either, so. No, nothing. Um, yeah, I, I think that's why the B is the Bridgerton kind of yeah. symbol that you see online and stuff like that, because it's B for Bridgerton plus this particular thing. And for some reason, I thought that the, and those of you that are like, Bridgerton scholars in the chat, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but for some reason I thought that the Viscount Who Loved Me came out first and she went back and wrote Simon and Daphne's book 
because mm. they were in, they were together and you, people were like, I, I, I might be completely and totally wrong. Like I'm probably wrong. Somebody will tell me, but for some reason I thought there was like a, a weird way that they came out or something. Mm. I don't know. Well, you definitely see that in the epilogue in Daphne and Simon's book with Colin. So yeah. now I, I read the second one, I'm like, oh, hang on a second. This actually ends quite well for this character because yeah. you've seen that snippet of a story. I yeah. thought that was kind of cool though. Yeah, I think that is because it's probably like a later edition. And she added mm -hmm. epilogues yeah. to later editions of the book after those other books that come out. Right. Emily just told me Duke was yeah. written first, so I'm wrong. I don't know what I'm thinking of in terms of like things that have gone back. I'm not super well versed in the Bridgerton universe, but anyway, I'm wrong. I knew it was going to be well, wrong. If only we had the power of knowledge at our fingertips <laughs> and we could actually use a device to type in a question. I can't an answered. I can't well, Google and chat at the same time. You know this. Can't do it. <laughs> Your tiny little hands. That's not the problem. My brain is working, Karen. <laughs> Sorry. In my mouth at the same time. The Google machine. Um, <laughs> Emily just told us that the epilogues are written at the end of the whole series. Emily, I really want to thank you for joining us tonight and being a fountain of knowledge. <laughs> thank you, Emily. Thank you. <laughs> we have epilogue two. So every original one had an epilogue. And now in re-release, there is a second epilogue in these books. Yay, Google. I knew that already from my Kindle edition. I didn't have to look that up right now. <laughs> oh, okay. Right, uh, Emily, back me up here. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so the B. So definitely there's a, yes, it, the, the, the symbol of the B. I think there's, there's a lot we could say it symbolizes and I'm sure we're stretching it a little far and Julia Quinn's like the B. But, but I'm sure there's a lot more. Well, what do you guys think the symbol of the Bridgertons should be if it isn't the B? It needs to be a mallet. Yeah, um, the black mallet, yeah. The mallet of death. Mallet of death. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if that comes up again in other books, but that's like the one thing that brings all of the characters together and shows them so well, except for Benedict. Yeah which I don't know where Benedict is. I can't wait to find out, but. Jewel, um, Emily is the mount, does the mallet come? I'm like speaking to Emily, like <laughs> to throw me through my, like she's right here. Emily, does the mallet come back? Just <laughs> wondering. Um, Julia Quinn didn't have anything to do with the bee. Yeah, I knew that. Like that's not, yeah, it's like a fan, thing. it's a fan Yeah, it's a fan thing. thing, but I think a mallet would have been a, a better, the mallet is. So yeah, maybe a mallet. <laughs> Thank you, I Emily. I mean, if somebody just, cricket mallets are not cute. You can't put them around like cute little fan works that you drew and like. Is it cricket? Or is it croquet? Is it Paul Mall? What are we playing? Well, I thought it was Paul Mall. It's croquet. It's not cricket. Oh, Thank yeah. You. I mean, I have a cricket bat in my bedroom. It's not of a mallet. Of course you do. Sorry that I said the okay. wrong sports thing. Uh, Alicia, Alicia just reminded us that, yes, the mallet should probably be it because it was most important enough that she wrote an entire second epilogue of this book around it. So she's right. Like, that's, yes. Yeah. And I think that that, that does, she's doing a little bit of fan service anyway, right? right. Like, like pulling something in that fans love and like want to talk about all the time and giving them something that revolves around it for their own amusement. Amusement, not amusement. <laughs> we're bemused about the bee, but we're amused about the mallet epilogue. Yay. Oh, the, she's got a lot of information over there. Um, so I will one. say, yeah, the based, so I remember the last book when we were talking about that one, we were like, we were discussing what we wanted to see when we read romance, if we like to see the, the quick wit or if we prefer to see the storyline. And I feel like this one gave us both really excellently. Mm -hmm. And I also thought that this one was funny versus I don't know that I really laughed all that hard in, in the Duke and I, or was that what it was called? The Duke yeah. and I? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought in particular, I was, well, the whole Paul Mall thing was hilarious, but Newton the dog cracked me up every time yeah. he was in that, in that story. And I thought that the way that Anthony interacted with the dog was very indicative of like, Anthony as a character, like even he's so alpha, even he's the alpha, he's even alpha dog, you know? Yeah, right. But the dog is still like into him. 
Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like even like his very first like down dog or whatever, like when he very first walks in and the dog is like, he's like just down and it just like sits down and is leading me like smiling at him. And I was like, oh, that's adorable. So she right. did a good job with that Corgi. Yeah. Yeah, she did. That was great. That was, that was, I love that Corgi. Yeah. And I think that the humor in this one does come out a whole lot more. She's got, because it doesn't really fall into the same really deep, depressing pattern that no. Duke and I did. I mean, Duke and I has this, has all of this really problematic material in it. And so it, it loses some of that. I think this one was able to like hold on to it and make it a real part of the rest of the book for a good long time. No, I thought it was, I thought it was um, the interaction between Kate and Anthony, I thought just jumped out on the page for me. It was just very quick. It was back and forth. It was heated. It was, you know, I was just like, I, I loved when they spoke to each other. I loved when they went back and forth with each other more so than the Duke and I. Um, so I really cannot wait and, for that interaction to happen on screen. Right. Because it is very, and it was very palpable. I was just like, ooh, you know, when, especially when they were like dancing and he would like, and I, okay, I loved anytime he would whisper into her ear. I was like, I felt it. I went, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so now everybody else list when they got um, tingly feelings in this yes. book and page Thank number you. and what he was saying and what was happening. When you're right. all about your tingle feelings in the yeah. chat. Thank you for posterity for the internet forever. <laughs> Forever. Forever. You're welcome. I mean, but speaking of scenes that we want to see, though, I want to see um, him in the office after the musical where he's like flirting with his mistress and she's under the table and either she sinks his claws into him or she bites him. Like, I need to yes. see her full on take a bite out of his cap while he's, while he's acting normal. That was hilarious. Yeah, that was great. And just and then you just see him like. You know, the the fact that he has this like reaction, but he's like, okay, that's, mm -mm, mm -mm, you know, and trying to hold back. Oh, that was great. And we were talking about the the show in relation to how much of this book is going to be in the show. And what was it that you found out about it, Heidi? So I saw that they had cast the Italian singer, Sienna Rossi or Rosso. I think it's Rosso. Rosso. I don't know. Um, they cast her and she is in all eight episodes. Of season wow. One. So but she's I a don't. major player. But I don't That's see great. anything about Kate Sheffield, unless they change the character's name. I've, I have scoured Reddit. I am I'm deep, deep in the hole, and I see nothing about Kate or Edwina or any of the Sheffields. So well, I think that it makes sense for the singer to be in the season, because in the season of The Duke and I, she would have been his mistress. Right, sure. exactly. So um, I think we'll see her as his mistress throughout the season. Emily, I feel like every time, like Emily, Emily, you're educating us. I love this. Emily says the scene that you just described, Heidi, that's a, actually a comic strip right now on oh. Juliet Quinn's site. Emily, yeah. I'm just going to call you um, the Cool Tables Lady Whistle Down. <laughs> <laughs> you're our Lady Whistle Down. So, readers. Lady Whistle Down of the Day Award. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Um, yeah, I did see that. Um, did you send that to us on Twitter, Emily, or was it someone else? I think it was you. Um, oh, Kate, Kate in the news sent us that comic strip. So, um, I'll put that in the chat so you guys can yeah. see it as well. It's very cute. It's great. No, that's a great scene. That would, that's a scene I would definitely, um, I would definitely like to come. To. I, I want to see the dog chase. I definitely want to see the dog chase, but I don't want it to end with his. Uh, what is this? My mouth is shut. I thought, what, what do you know? What do you know, Emily? I don't like Emily, to not, not, not be, Emily, I'm usually the person that knows all the things. And so here's how I feel about you right now. You need to tell me what you know, Emily. And then, and then I will be them. I will be your Dwight Schrute to your Michael Scott. You tell me what you know, and then I will tell the rest of everybody what it is that they need to know. Does that make sense? So just I let me know what you I know. You know? Should, should, um, form an alliance here, Beth. Emily is lady mm. whistling now. She's only going to let you know what you need to know at that moment. <laughs> Slowly. She no. just said, I know all the things. And I I just need you to know that I don't like this dynamic as much as some <laughs> other people might. I'm starting to think Emily is Julia. And she's just I, honest she right now. Possibly, actually. <laughs> Look, look at this. She just got like a shitty grin on her face. She just over there being better than us. Ugh. Can't take it. 
She knows all she the She has the actual mallet of death. She has the power. <laughs> Emily, why are you saying you are not allowed to say? Did you sign a did you sign a non-disclosure agreement? Who are you? <laughs> I'm just going to read book three in about an hour and a half tomorrow, and then I'll know most of the things, too. Oh, that's not going to work. I don't think. I'm pretty sure that's not going to work. Yeah. Oh, Emily, thank you for keeping us on our toes. So, no, I was going to say I was definitely um, I was definitely going. I definitely look forward to the dog chasing. I just don't want Anthony yelling at the end. We don't need we don't need that. You know, he's just, so mean to her. He's so, so mean. mean. You know what? You know what's funny about that scene. I loved later in the book when Kate finally gets up the nerve to ask Edwina, "What did they talk about in the carriage?" And that's the foreshadowing. That's the hints where she's like, "We didn't talk about anything," because he was already in love with Kate. He didn't have. I'm sorry, we're all freaking out. <laughs> we're freaking out for a second. Emily is Julia's sister, which we missed at the beginning of the chat all somehow. All the presses. <laughs> huh. Huh. Emily? I'm sorry, Emily. We are, we get drunk when we do this, and so this is your first time. We just, we're not paying attention to things well enough. But she runs her website, and she's Julia's sister. Thank you for being here, Emily. Oh, that was God. wonderful. I'm going to hide my margarita now. <laughs> She really is Lady Whistledown, though. That's the thing, Julia. She is, and I think we can all agree that it's one of the sisters. <laughs> no, it's no, not. No. We, we know, know who it is. is. Yeah, so we know who it is. No, it's it's Emily. <laughs> <laughs> it should be. I'm looking back at like the beginning of the chat, and I'm like, I don't know what is happening here. Oh, I, 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 I love the fact that Anthony's father died by a bee sting. It was lovely. <laughs> it, was <laughs> for our, it worked. It worked. <laughs> Wait, yeah. Excuse us, Emily. Let's just go back really quick. No, 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 no. <laughs> Rewind. Fabulous. Rewind. Oh, man. Oh. It's hot in here now. Look how red I am. <laughs> oh, heaven. And truthfully, oh. Emily, I would have said all this shit even if Julia was on. No, I oh, my God. It. Emily, at one point, said... Julia did a lot of research on on that the trauma it's a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> There's citations. It's in the Your sister's amazing log. And so are you. I just didn't get to that epilogue. <laughs> your, your your parents should be very proud of both of you. Okay. I had a blanket on my legs. I'm having to take off because now I'm hot. Okay. Oh. Emily, you are super funny. You're absolutely right. We're the funniest people you're ever going to see on the internet. We're real people. Real people. Emily. Now everybody tell Emily where the tingles got you in this book, please. So she can relate. Well, I, I am not afraid to admit that I reread the wedding night scene for the third night in a row last night. Wow, Karen. How'd that work out for you, Karen? <laughs> you thumbs up. One thumb up because the other one's busy. <laughs> well, I'm not going to say there was a cigarette and a towel next to the bed, but I did read it for the third time. Oh, <laughs> that's good news. Right. That is good news. We really need to talk about this book more. Okay. I know. <laughs> the tingles, though, the tingles. I think I generally just like assholes. And because I respect him, because I'm kind of an asshole. And so, uh, and I married the nicest guy on the planet. So when he's mean to me, I'm like, oh my gosh, who are you? This is so sweet, but I'm here than you are. Um, anyway, so I think what I liked, honestly, was whenever he told that dog to shut up, he was like, uh-uh, no, I'm in charge. And I was like, oh, he's, <laughs> the, even the animal kingdom is since the Anthony. So that. And whenever he told Bear, Bear Brook or the idiot Nigel Bear Brook, Nigel. To like, mm -hmm. like, stay here. I got your girl. You're an mm -hmm. idiot. I'll be back. Like, he just took charge of the whole thing. I think that's that's what sold me on the end. Was thing. Nigel written after Neville Longbottom? It's so he has a major grow, like, yeah. glow up at the end of so. so. That's fine. He might glow up. But. <laughs> right. Um, here's my, just to reiterate what gave me the tingles. Um, I actually highlighted this. I said the music drew to a close, leaving them standing in the middle of the ballroom floor facing one another. So right off the bat, it's like that that tension that's very much like 
<laughs> palpable. And then Anthony took her arm, but before he led her back to the perimeter of the room, he put his lips very close to her ear and whispered, and you, Miss Sheffield, have issued to me a most delicious challenge. <laughs> Yeah, but that challenge is about her sister. Yeah. yeah, but you know what? It still whispered in your ear, and the word delicious challenge came to it. I love it. That's yeah. capital R rake. Yeah. Right there. That's bring it, but I really want you. I, I want really inside your pantaloons. I really like when he pulls a Knightley, a, a George Knightley, and he um escorts Penelope Featherington to dinner in front of whatever her name is. Um, yeah, which I guess really endears Kate to him. And it doesn't necessarily like give me the tingles, but it's my favorite moment of Anthony's in the novel where he's just mm -hmm. one, because he's very obviously pulling a George Knightley. And, um, and then it's just, it's just the fully the right thing to do. And he has the most cachet in that room. He's the man with the, you know, with the most cachet. Obviously, this woman wants him and to just completely ignore her. Not just okay. George Knightley comes and comes to the the rescue of Harriet Smith, like with, you know, aplomb and gentility and all of these other things. But Anthony comes to Penelope Featherington's aid with like his asshole tendencies. He looks right at that girl and he's like, I'm sorry, did I invite you into this conversation? Right. <laughs> no, and it's so much better. It's like mwah, just chef's kiss moment where he's just like, I didn't talk to you. And then he just grabs Penelope and goes into dinner. It's perfect. I love it. I love Kate's response to it where she's just like, oh, shit, I think I like him now. And yeah. I just, that's my favorite part. And then right after that is the scene in the library where he comes mm -hmm. and presents her whenever she mm -hmm. when the lightning storm is happening, which I reread the first time I read this book, I had kind of that initial reaction of like, Oh, this guy is just mean. Like, why is he yelling at everybody? And why is he like, and then the second time I read it, I was like, Oh no, he's got a nice little marshmallowy center. That's just, been yeah. he has too much responsibility. And I'm an oldest child. I get that responsibility. Um, so that scene of him holding her, it's the first time I think he says her first name instead of, Miss Sheffield, and he calls her Kate, and yeah. holds her until she stops trembling. It's just right. so, so yeah, that's good. sweet. Um, yeah, I think Elise just asked, "What book is this? Who is George Smith? I must read." It's George Knightley, and it's Emma by Jane Austen. Austen. So go go read Emma if you haven't read it, or you could just watch Clueless. No, you cannot <laughs> watch Clueless. You can. Hey, for Paul an Rudd. Emma experience. Now, I understand that it is based on Emma, but it is not Emma. And there is no Knightley in that movie. There's just Paul Rudd. <laughs> Paul Rudd, okay. who's not aged. Paul Rudd actually looks better yeah. now than he did. The robot. Yeah. In so. um, Emily just said, at the beginning, he asked his brothers, who's the biggest sensation? And when he's told Edwina, he says, fine, I'll marry her. It has nothing to do with pissing off Kate. I think so too. I don't think he's like out trying to purposefully irritate Kate no. with this particular thing. Um, he doesn't even know Kate at that point. Um, and he's just single minded. Um, and I don't even think, I think there's moments where he talks about Edwina or um, does stuff like the Paul Molly like taking too long to get her there and stuff like that. Right. Too good. That's to piss off Kate. But I think sure. he's sincere in that he thinks that Edwina would be the best wife for him. So, right. So I picked up on two little threads that I might be completely just reading into shit that I shouldn't read into. But to me, that whole who's the biggest sensation is about winning. He's the top dog. He knows he's the most eligible bachelor and he's going to go off through the most beautiful woman. Right. Doesn't care about her station. Doesn't care about a dowry. No, he is going to win. And then on the wedding night with Kate, there's a couple of sentences where he feels like he had a secret that he really won because nobody else knows how beautiful she is. Like Aww. he's the one that's able to see that. Now it's like, first of all, still on brand, he's winning, but it was also sort of a delightful little secret. And I think that there's a parallel there. It's about winning. Right. He realizes in that moment, he really, really, really won. Even though he goes and stomps out in the rain a couple of weeks later and all that stuff. But that, that little moment on the wedding night, I thought was just a couple of sentences was great. Yeah, I also love the fact that after 
they get married. He even says, I will still take, take care of Edwina. Like, I'm not going to, your family is now my family. Your, yeah. your Mary is my, is my, you know, your family will, yeah. your family will be taken care of. They're my family. And so it's like right there, it was just, and that's where she she like, I think she even fell even more in love with him. Yeah. Oh, but I liked also that he was, even whenever he was being like, okay, who's the, who's the bell of the ball right now? Like I'll marry her. He still wanted someone who was going to be a good mother to his right. children after he died and who was right. smart and who wouldn't bore him. He just didn't want to fall in love with her. Right. Because he thought that would yeah. make everything harder because his life was Absolutely. so hard because of the love. Yeah. And I think we also have to look at the fact that he is in the order of the way things are going. He's just coming off of the Daffing and Simon business. So mm -hmm. when he's like deciding that he's gonna get married, he's almost doing it just a tiny bit. There's a little bit of spite there, I think. Like a little bit of like, my best friend who I'm super mad at and super pissed at married my sister. Now I gotta do it. Like, I think he's just kind of, there's got to be something in the back of his mind. Like even if he's unaware of it, he doesn't talk about it in the novel where there's just a little, whether it's competition or just getting it over with for the sake of it. I think he wants to win. That's why he picks the bell of the ball. That's why he picks Edwina. But at the same, but he's coming off of like these heightened emotions regarding his sister's marriage. Oh yeah, yeah. I definitely think it was the sense of I need to do this now because my time in my mind, my time is coming to a close. So I have to be able to woo someone. We have to get married. There has to be children, not just one, probably multiple children. And then I can go and no one's going to be, don't worry, because we're not in love. So when I pass away, yes, they'll be sad, but she's not going to be, you know, mourning for me over, you know, every single day. <laughs> Alicia just said, it's been a year. Why is he still holding on to that shit? Let it go. Anthony. <laughs> he never says that he is. I just personally, I mean, he does mention it later that he's like irritated with him, but I just think it might be a, a you know, a background motivation for him. Yeah. But that's also part of like the fun part of marrying on um, that first book trope, the marrying your best, your brother's best friend is that it pisses off your brother. That's kind of that's right. Trope. So yeah, <laughs> you got to keep that going. Yeah. So. Oh, so. Uh, oh, Anthony. So we think this will be season two then we don't think this, any of this is going to come up in season one. We don't think, and I did see a rumor that season two has been greenlit. Um, for next oh, really? summer. Oh. That's what I saw. I don't know how legit it was. It was like some obscure, you know, blog that said it. So I don't know how they're gonna film that with social distancing. How are you gonna do a reason to romance? I mean, I guess the dancing is is I don't know. It's gonna be interesting. <laughs> well, yeah. Is there you, still like, is it still in England? Is it still quarantine everyone together? Yeah. Right. Is it still though going is is quarantine still happening in England? Because they're filming this in England. Is that still Yeah. A long I was even reading I even read something that said that um that Outlander they'll they're gonna have to cut back on sex scenes because of of I COVID. think that is full on some nonsense speculation. That okay. was a, that was an extrapolation from nothing that, that was just in that the real just, world. I Katrina read that too. Hoping. I think it was, I think it's just an extrapolation. Katrina hoping. Yeah. <laughs> Katrina actually started the rumor. So Laura just asked, um, are they doing one book per season? I can't imagine that it could get that many eps out of each of these books. Um, from everything that I've read and, and looked at, it looks like, yes, season one is book one, but with elements of other books in it. So like, for instance, Penelope Featherington has a larger role in the series than she does in book one. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing with Benedict and Colin and, you know, the ones that you only see here and there, they're going to be real characters throughout. So like we just said that Anthony in the events that happen in book one is probably with the mistress, um, the singer mistress, mm -hmm. that's going to be part of probably what's happening in the first season. This is my assumption um, because they're just, they're marrying things that happen. But the thrust of the first season is Daphne and Simon's relationship and their struck. Mm -hmm. The thrust. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Calm down, everybody. We'll read the marriage scene again. 
Tingles. Um, but yeah, the first, in the, about 10 minutes. The first season also is fully wrapped. So we're we are gonna get it this fall, but then again, of course, we're gonna have to wait years, just like we're gonna have to wait years for everything because nothing's gonna be able to film yeah. right away. Yeah. So it's gonna suck, but you know. So favorite scenes from this book? I mean, we are, I know we already talked about things that we gave us the tingles. But is there anything other than the dog, other than, you know, the moment under the desk or the wedding night scene that just like stick out to you as being like super fun or that you would like to see on screen eventually? There's a season two. I liked whenever uh, he was forced into agreeing to marrying her because of the bee and the bubbies as miss featherington said and then he's like mom get her out of here and then drags her drags kate into the gazebo and just like kisses the hell out of her that was really great because even though he was forced into something he actually felt free by the fact that like okay finally i get to get what i want yeah i like colin um pushing them together at the very beginning yeah. <laughs> i like the machinations of the bridgerton family i like yeah. that they are in all each other's business that they're fully aware of when someone is probably right for their sibling or their child. And they're just like, I got this. Let me, let me, let me just make this happen. And I just love that Colin was there to see how much they would be able to play off of one another and how fun it would be to watch. And so I really like that scene. Well, it's also Colin who at the end is the one that's like, dude, just go and tell her you love her. Stop this. Yeah. This is ridiculous. Go, go. You know, so Colin's that, already my favorite character, hands down. Yeah, yeah. He's been in like two and a half percent of the two books that I've read, and already Colin's my favorite character. Yeah, I like Colin a lot too. What is everybody's favorite character? Because I, I know a lot of people say Colin, but I'm, I'm interested to see if anybody has a favorite Bridgerton that isn't Colin. That's oh, Benedict sucks. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's what it says on the screen. That's what Elise oh, just no. said Benedict sucks, so. <laughs> I haven't read um, Benedict's book. I actually Me really either. did. I really did like Anthony in this book. As a Bridgerton, I was very, I, I like, other than the first maybe, I was like, oh, I don't know about this guy. Like, why is everybody praising him? And then I, I, like, I got it. And I was, I just, there's something strong about him. And the rake with the capital R. Oh, Elise <laughs> agrees. Elise agrees. Thank you, Elise. Um, Emily just said um, she loves Penelope. I love Penelope as well. Emma says she has no idea who Benedict is. Yeah, I've only read these first two books. There's I know. Benedict is barely there. Um, I don't, but I love Hyacinth. I like. I know she's only like eleven. I think she's really great. I think her whatever's going to happen with Hyacinth's book is going to be great. I haven't read it yet. Obviously, it's out there, but I haven't read it yet. Um, and Brett just agrees. Oh, and Alicia. Was it Eloise that had her that had Kate show up whenever Anthony was hiding in the office and she had been spying outside and she got all excited that Kate said she'd be a good spy? I think yes. that was Eloise. I yes. liked that. That was yeah. funny. I love a little girl who's like in a wedding and can't shut up. And she's like, he started it. Like I love a girl that just like would have stood on the table and been like, I've been eating sugar. What of it? Like that's my favorite kind of kid. So that makes me feel like. Yeah, Emily just said we've only read two books. Yes, <laughs> we're, 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 we're trying to pay off Emily. You know, we're I, we are virgins. We need mom to come explain the whole thing to us. I have to say, no, I've no, done no, 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 no. We do not. <laughs> I've read three no. books. <laughs> I've read three yes, of, of them. Of course, you can come back, Emily. You can yes, come definitely back. come back. You can join us. <laughs> I've done book clubs where I've known everything about the whole series and it's, and that can be super fun. But I've also done book clubs where I've known nothing and we've all just come into it totally green. And that's also very fun. So, you know, this one, we're coming into it fairly green. Like I read Bridgerton back. I read the first two back in December. I read them for book club and I read the third one and now we're just, we're going to keep moving on. So I'm excited. Please come back. I've been super, I'm, super, I'm happy with everybody that's here. Allison just said, Hyacinth's book shows off her awesomeness, but Lady Danberg is phenomenal. You have to read them all now. Lady okay. Danberg. I wasn't anticipating liking her very much. What is, is she there, Is there a Violet book? Is there a book only on Violet? Um, I read I'm that Julia said that she 
there's there's prequels that involve people that are like surrounding them but aren't necessarily a that she isn't or hasn't written an Edmund Violet prequel because it's in sat like he dies. So I don't want an Edmund Violet prequel. I want hot as shit late 50s Violet finding oh. love again later in life. I think we said that last time we did this too that she got her own story too. Yeah, that'd be great. Violet, yeah. The balls. Yeah, that would be great to see Mama Bridgerton find new yeah. love, as Laura just said. Yeah. That's what I, I want to, she's such, I love Mama Bridgerton. She just, she just cuts right to it. She needs to, we need to find her love again. She does um, a lot of it. Oh. Emily just told us no. Get out of our chat, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, why are you going to kill me? Uh. Um, and Nikki said she Edmund, was so in love. Edmund That's and Violet show up a little bit in the late of uh, the, the Rokesbury stories. Yes, like that, like Anthony and Colin being bit, like little and babies. I've I've yeah. read about all that happening in the prequel series that that they're in it, but it's not their story. Yeah, which is super cute. I think it's super cute. Yeah. Well, all I that's left is for, is for Emily to tell us when the show's going to air. That's so yes. Yeah, Your Emily. Day, Emily, because I mean, <laughs> that's really all anybody cares about. Laura just said, I've written fan fiction and I'm not afraid to do it again. <laughs> hey, haven't we all? Haven't we all gotten to that point? I haven't. She says she doesn't know, but I find that I find that dubious. Lady Wissadown knows Excellent everything. Use of dubious, Beth. What? Excellent use of dubious. Thank you. <laughs> I'm super drunk too, so you know that that's like a real world I know. Like it's in there. <laughs> oh my gosh, guys, this was the Viscount who loved me. Great chat. This was super fun. Um, we're going to do it again with the next one, which I don't know the name of it to. Romancing Mr. Bridgerton. Is that the next one? Anybody? Um, Emily? No, <laughs> Emily. Emily. Offer from a gentleman. Offer from a gentleman. That's Benedict's story. Yeah. And then romancing Mr. Bridgerton. See, for some reason, when I purchased these on Kindle uh, months and months and months ago, I for some reason the third one didn't isn't what I bought, and I bought the fourth one. So that's the order I read them in. I skipped the third one, but I liked Colin's book, so we're into. I'm into it. Offer from a gentleman. Here we go. We're getting really excited about it. And guys, if this is your first time joining us for a chat for the cool table, thank you so much for coming. We have lots of chats if you like Outlander and other stuff. Um, and we have more chats coming your way. Like uh, we're about to do the Grishaverse series uh, with Lee Bardugo. Um, we're doing some books from the 1619 list. And we'll be talking about one of those in July. And we're going to be doing the rest of the Bridgerton series here coming up soon so that we're ready when the show comes out. And we'll be as smart as Emily is about the whole thing before it happens. That's our plan. We just want to make sure we have all the info. Emily. Okay. And when Emily says stuff like there's a scene in an, an offer that will give you all the feels, we won't have to die right now. We'll know. We'll be like, yes, we know that scene. Dials up on Kindle. Boom. <laughs> so go get Offer from a Gentleman right now, guys. Read it. We'll talk about it very, very soon. Yes, Emily, we will let you know when we're on with Offer. Yes. And uh, follow us on Twitter, you guys. All of us, our names are on here. And uh, we love you all. Thank you for joining Bye. us. Bye. Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.